Good evening, everyone. This is Bishop K.R. Woods of Covenant Church in Berkeley, California. You're live on Facebook Live and YouTube Live on the Quest Online Bible Study. It is good to have you tonight. I am so, so blessed that you come on into the room tonight to receive the Word of God. And I'm telling you, it's going to be a rich word tonight. So I need you to share, like, invite let your friends and your family know that Bishop is on, and we're continuing our incredible series entitled Dirt. <laughs> oh my God, uh, this has been a life changer. This has been a life changer. Uh, we've been teaching and preaching this all month long, how God uses ordinary things to do extraordinary things. What that means is God can use ordinary you and ordinary me to do extraordinary things. Therefore, that makes us extraordinary. Oh, you need to pop your collar and just say, hey, I'm extraordinary in God's eyes. So don't keep all this goodness to yourself. Share, like, and invite. I want to see those shares up. I want to see those likes up. I want to get those comments. I need some amen, some praise the Lord. I know God's gonna is bringing us forth out of this pandemic but in the meantime, we're going to praise him, we're going to learn, we're going to worship, and we're going to glorify him right here on social media. Is that all right? So tonight, let's get ready. A couple of announcements, just a little housekeeping just to let you know that uh, Covenant Church, our doors are open. Our doors are open 8 a.m. and 11 a.m. on Sunday morning for the month of January and February. We will be down on Wednesday night. The doors won't be open on Wednesday night for our midweek worship experience uh, due to the surge in the Omicron variant. And certainly we want to be uh, prudent and wise in uh, these earthly and carnal things, certainly knowing that spiritual things and divine things will supersede them all and bring about healing. But in the meantime, we want uh, to keep everybody safe and your bishop has uh, you in mind and, and certainly does our, our executive team here at Covenant Church. So, um, so Sunday morning, our doors are open, but if you cannot come because of COVID concerns, be with us online. Every Covenant member, I'm looking for you at 11 a.m. A lot of great ministries out there and certainly you're welcome to to uh, listen and to and uh, go to any church you want to that's preaching truth and you know what truth is now. Uh, you're certainly able to do that, but not just not at 11 a.m. on Sunday morning. You're right here at the Cub where you are divinely ordained to be under the teaching of your pastor. Is that all right? Is that fair? All right. And once of that, you can go check out all everybody and enjoy this ministry. And, and that's one of the beauties of this uh, this social media age. It allows us uh, to uh, check out a whole lot of things and stay under the word, but just making sure that that word is uh, applicable to uh, our lives, that, that what is being taught is rather, is being is applicable to the Bible and is in line with what your pastor teaches of whom you can text and ask questions. Uh, and you can't do that to just anybody online. That's why you must have a local church pastor. There are no, there is no such thing biblically as a freelance uh, saint. It is not there. Believe me, I've got, I've got a degree in this, and I've, all my other pastors will, will affirm as well. There is no such thing as a freelance saint without a, a, a pastor and a church. Uh, the church is one and the same in Christ. I'm, I'm redefining that carnal notion that has slipped into the church as if the church is separate than Christ. The Bible explicitly says that the church is the body of Christ. In fact, he loved the church so much, he called it his bride. Uh, he, he, he personified the church. So in other words, if you love the Lord, if you are truly being saved, if you are truly spirit-filled, there will not be any trepidation about being in church, whether that is online or 
in person. It's, it's, it, 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 anything else is carnality, it is humanistic, and it is uh, error. And it is the type of thing that will cause the Lord to say, uh, depart from me, you work of iniquity. I knew you not. Because those who know him intimately want to be with him in worship. Is that all right? I always give you a little freebie to help you because uh, it's so important that you, you continue to be pastored through these times. Because again, on social media, it can feel very much like a, like a, um, like a motivational speech. And my name is not Les Brown. It is Kelly Woods, Bishop, Pastor Kelly Woods, to teach you how to get to heaven. And that's what we're going to do tonight. So tonight we're going to continue in our, our series, the Dirt Series, and, and we're going to continue in uh, the very uh, powerful teaching that we began on last week entitled, A House Not Made With Hands. A House Not Made With with hands. All right, uh, let me do a little reading for you. It's a lot of scripture, so we couldn't put it all on the screen, but I want to get you you're caught up. Uh, we're in 2 uh, Corinthians chapter number 5, uh, verse numbers 5 through 10 in the New International Version. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 5 through 10 in the New International Version. Now the one who has fashioned us for this very purpose is God, who has given us the spirit as a deposit or the earnest, as King James says, guaranteeing what is to come. Verse 6, therefore we are always confident in knowing that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord, for we live by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So we make it our goal to please him whether we are at home in the body or away from it. Verse number 10, for we must all appear. Check out that segue in the text. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Now the one who has fashioned us for this very purpose is God, who has given us the spirit as a, down, as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. I want to give you that verse number five again. I want to give you that word tonight. All right, let's begin. Um, I, I read the scriptures tonight uh, because we're going to do uh, some expository teaching tonight right through the text. Um, it, it's very important to recognize that everything we need to know about the text is revealed through the text. In fact, if the text were the meat, then all of the gravy is being generated from the text, all right? And that's going to help you in your, your study of the Bible, in the way you approach uh, uh, scriptures. And, and, and that's what you've got, you've got a, a, a pastor that teaches you uh, the Word of God and how to approach the Word of God so that it's, it's, it's holistic. So you're not creating these hybrid ideals of God based upon a salad bowl type of, I want a little tomatoes, I want a little croutons, and put it all together, uh, sort of a, a gumbo of, of your, your uh, understanding and interpretation. We call it in, in, in seminary and circles, we call it hermeneutics, your, your understanding of the word of God. So to understand it holistically. So we're going to look at it in an expository sense tonight. Um, in fact, uh, this teaching began in the fourth chapter of the book of 2 Corinthians. Paul begins to uh, talk to us about our eternality. He begins to talk to us about how God has taken earthen vessels or clay vessels, clay jars, and place the greatest treasure in them. The, the contrast that he's making there is that he's used a very ordinary, crude, earthen vessel to place the most precious oil within it, which is his Holy Spirit, his anointing, his love, his glory, and his eternal life. Very important point. 
So Paul begins to weigh, starting in the fourth chapter and, and moving into the fifth chapter, recognizing there were no, no chapter divisions in, in the original man, manuscripts of these letters when they were written, when they were later canonized, the chapters were added for our convenience, and I thank God for it. Uh, it makes it much easier. Um, that he, he segues into this idea of earthen vessels, ordinary things. Fifth chapter of 2 Corinthians, he begins to talk about a tent, very crude tent uh, that uh, anyone uh, that was uh, in his society would understand. And he begins to juxtapose that idea uh, uh, and, and begins to look at a tent here on earth, but a home in heaven. We brought in last week the idea of Jesus in St. John chapter number 14. He says, in my father's house, there are many mansions. Now, uh, the, the Greek construct of that text is that in my father's house, there is much room. But just for some fun, you know, uh, Paul says his home is going to be in heaven. So when we get to heaven, there's going to be much room. We're going to have a mansion in the sky. So I, I love King James Version where he says that. Uh, does that mean it's MTV Cribs? Of course not. Does it mean the lifestyle of the lifted, living, uh, rich and famous? Of course not. It means something that is unfathomable, something that you cannot even conceive on earth. So you think of the most incredible structures here on earth. What God has prepared for us, eyes have not seen and ears have not heard. heard. We haven't even conceived in our, in our hearts the things that God has prepared for those who love him. All right. So, Paul continues here in his teaching in the fifth verse of 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. He had just gave us a tremendous revelation, and I hope you caught that. If you're just coming on tonight, or if you missed the Bible study last week, you've got to go back and do your homework uh, to understand this teaching. Uh, in the last week's teaching, he, he, he told us that God was taking us from tent to home. From a, from a temporal state to a permanent state in eternal life. So he's focusing our lives not just on the present uh, state that we're in, in, in this, this earth, or this, this, this terra firma, this terrestrial state, but he's telling us to keep our eyes on, on this earth and what's happening here, but it's also, let's keep our eyes fixed on heaven, where those who are looking for a city, whose builder and maker is God. And he, and he starts off the, the concept with that. For if our earthly house of this tabernacle be dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hand, hands, eternal in the heavens. Uh, that's 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 1. And then he begins to speak to us in a profound revelation that most of us miss. He says, I don't desire to not, I don't desire to be unclothed, but rather I desire to be clothed upon with eternal life. So what, he, what he's doing is he's making a masterful co contrast that we are clothed in these mortal bodies. And the idea of mortality is we are alive, but it's living that is destined for death as opposed to life abundant life, zoe life, zoe life, which is life eternal, indes uh, eternal, indestructible life. So in other words, yes, we have life in these clay jars of bodies that we have, but they are destined to death. God is going to, the word he uses is swallow up our mortality with immortality. Now, what are the implications of that? The, the implications of that are, are twofold. You've got to get this. Uh, is that when a person dies as a Christian, they go from mortal life to eternal life immediately. Therefore, that's why Jesus can make the claims that he that is in me shall never die. Therefore, you're just going from one state of life to another state of life. I know for those of us who are mourning our loved ones and for those of us who are mourning our friends, we're looking there and they say, they look dead to me. Well, that's only because we only understand this mortal life. 
But if we truly have tapped into the teachings of Paul and truly believe what the Bible says, although we'll miss our loved ones, we will recognize they've just taken, they've just allowed one fashion of life to be overshadowed with eternal life. They go straight into eternality with God. Isn't that a wonderful thing? And even for those who us are who are alive and remain at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, we call it the rapture, the translation of the saints. Uh, 1 Corinthians 14, uh, 15, rather, uh, as well as uh, the fourth chapter of the book of 1 Thessalonians. Uh, the rapture takes place in the twinkling of an eye. And we don't really think about the significance of a bat of an eye or one twentieth of a second. The point is there is that the Lord is going to return for his church in one twentieth of a second. In other words, it's hyperbole that it will be an immeasurable amount of time, as if it is as no time as all at all. So in other words, there will no be no time where you will be spiritually naked. Uh-huh. In other words, your body will clothe you in mortality, but eternal life will clothe you and his glorious life in an incorruptible body that can endure. Uh-huh. Eternity will be, will overshadow your mortality. It is some of the most profound teaching in all the New Testament. And I know my, my theologian and my word lovers and my, and my pastors and, 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 and the people on here are just going nuts about that concept. Because it is the concept by which all of us derive the strength to endure as pilgrims here in this earth. All right, let's roll, let's go. Fifth chapter, excuse me, uh, 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 fifth chapter, verse number five, book in second, uh, book second Corinthians, excuse me. All right, let's check it out. He says, now the one who has fashioned us for this very purpose, is God, who has given us the spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. Two words there that are used in the text. This is the NIV. Sometimes I like the King James Version because it gives the original words. The, the first word there is he uses the word wrought. It's not a word we use often. Uh, we, don't, we, don't, we don't use the word wrought often. Uh, you know, what does that mean? It means to be equipped or to fashion. In other words, to form. Hmm, to form. Hmm. Fourth chapter, he just talked about forming clay pots, placing oil in those clay pots. Hmm. He, he, he talked to uh, Jeremiah and, 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 and talked to him and, and said, go down to the potter's house and you'll see uh, a, a potter who has his masterpiece on the wheel. And even when it was marred, he started over again and, and he made it. Perfect. Hmm. This back. Something is ringing a bell. Something is ringing a bell here. Formed. Formed. In the beginning, God scooped Adam from the dust of the earth, blew the breath of life in him, the breath of life in him, and he became a living soul. The word there is the word form. He brought him from the soil. So here it is. Paul is picking up that same idea here in 2 Corinthians, and he's saying, now he who has fashioned us, shaped us for this very purpose is God himself, who has given us the second word. The word fashion means to cause to be thoroughly prepared, to prepare, to make ready. The second word he uses there has given us the spirit as a deposit. The word deposit is an old English word for called earnest, E-A-R-N-E-S-T. It means a guarantee, a pledge, or a down payment. If you ever bought a home, uh, when you went into contract, you had to put down earnest money. All right, we're going to frame this up. It's going to be some uh, terrific panoramic uh, preaching here. Let's go. Uh, the first thing he says is that God has formed us. In other words, he has formed us in a physical form, huh? but he is also for forming us spiritually. With Adam, he was formed physically. God breathed the breath of life in him. So from the very beginning, it gives us 
the, the inference that God is always dealing with mankind in a duality. He's always dealing with mankind as both flesh and spirit. He, he's always dealing with mankind both in the divine as well as the human. It's sort of a, a hypostasis like Jesus Christ. Um, so in other words, it, it speaks to our total dimension, which makes us a living soul, the, 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 the spiritual and the fusion of the terrestrial makes us a living soul. Are y'all following me here? This is good stuff. Put it in the com in the comments. All right, we're going somewhere. Don't you feel it? Don't you feel it? Can't you feel it? Can't you? Uh oh, that's Michael Jackson. Let me, let me go back. So here it is. Um, don't you feel it coming? So here it is. Um, he's saying to us that God is continually forming us. And I want to tell you that God's forming is happening in a robust way spiritually. In other words, your body may be decaying, but your inner house, Paul introduces in his text, that your inner house is being built. He, he puts it like this. As our outward man is decaying, we are being renewed in our spirit day by day. In other words, God's got a construction crew going on inside of you. He's forming the best you. He's forming you spiritually. He's forming you and I morally. He's forming you and I even intellectually because intellect comes from the mind and the mind is influenced by the spirit. He is, he is forming our, our vision and our purpose. He is, he is forming us and preparing us for his plan for us here on earth. But the crescendo, the, the zenith, the pinnacle, the epitome of God's forming us is he's forming us spiritually to be able to endure eternal life. Because these bodies as they are cannot endure eternality. So in other words, what that means is that these corruptible bodies are not fashioned for eternity. Huh? As they are. Adam messed that up and when sin came in. So how do we get God's creation prepared for eternity? God's creations get prepared for eternity by God constructing an inner man, an inner man that will manifest in eternal life. In other words, I, I often thought about how those, those shuttles, space shuttles, can burst through the Earth's atmosphere thousands and tens of thousands of degrees in temperature. How can they endure space and the, the zero gravity aspects of, of space because they're right, made of the right materials? Check this out. God could have used any material. My friend, Elder Claiborne, Eric Claiborne preached on me yesterday and made a very profound point. God could have used any material, gold or platinum, God could have used silver, any type of material, but he chose to use just dirt, just, just a, an abundant commodity, just dirt. Anybody can pick up dirt. God made dirt. Dirt don't hurt. Um, he used that to be the material that he would glorify for eternity to endure in eternity. Are you hearing what I'm telling you? So God says, you think there's no value in your dirt. Well, there's no value according to the flesh, living according to the flesh. But there's value in the humility of this dirt. There's value in uh, the ordinary nature of it. Because God says, as long as you recognize that your strength, your becoming something, your holding of great treasure, and even your holding of, of, of endurance of eternal life is not because you're gold, not because you're platinum, not because you're silver, but because you're dirt. When you recognize that, it makes the beauty of what's held in the container, the heart, the soul, the will, the mind, uh -huh, motivations, the emotion. It makes the beauty of what's held within the container even better. That's a beautiful picture. Amen? So, the word earnest 
uh, or uh, it, it comes from the idea of an engagement ring or a down payment. So this word occurs three times in the New Testament and, and it, it conveys the idea of property or wages or blessing that binds the promise with an advanced gift, a pledge or a token, a benefit that's bestowed, meaning that something greater is coming. When you put down earnest money on a house, it's $5,000, $10,000. That means you're going to come up with the other $30,000 at the close of the escrow. Um, when uh, that man finds that, that exquisite woman and looks her in the eyes and gets down on one knees, I, I don't know if gondolas were, uh, you were on a gondola. If, I don't know if you had a man with a mandolin uh, uh, playing behind you. I don't know if it was a serenade made from a from a window. I, I don't know what it is. Uh, just make sure that ring was right. Are you hearing what I'm telling you? Um, when he says, I want you to be my wife, he can't come empty-handed. Mm -hmm. He can't come empty-handed. <coughs> don't, it, don't, it doesn't have to come from Tiffany's, and it, and it doesn't have to come. Some of y'all said, no, you, 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 you don't think it does, huh, Bishop? Uh, well, I'll leave that to you. Uh, but whatever it comes from, he's got to come with an engagement ring or some type of dowry or some type of endowment to say, I am going to put a deposit on this. I'm going to put it on the layaway. I got a, I got a thousand of them tonight. Uh, here you hear you, gonna, me? You're going you're gonna to put this one on the layaway because in a few months or in, in a year or however it's going to be, I'm going to purchase. Uh -huh. I'm going to purchase this, this bride. That's the same thing that, that, God, that uh, Jesus says concerning us. He says he, he makes his bride the church Perfect, without spot or what wrinkle. He's purchased it, purchased the church with his own blood. In other words, it's his because he put the down payment and he is going to redeem us and give us the fullness of the redemptive value. Can I talk to you? God has given us, in a spiritual sense, the earnest of the inheritance, the down payment on eternal life through the Holy Spirit. All right, get ready, open it up, get ready. Don't quit smacking gum and, and get off your text because you don't want to miss this one. Um, the Holy Spirit is the down payment on eternal life. The Bible says that in Ephesians chapter 1, right here in, in this text. The Holy Spirit is the down payment on eternal life. Therefore, if one does not have the Holy Spirit, it's like a woman walking around talking about, I'm getting married but ain't got no engagement ring. Oh, he loved me, girl. I'm telling you, he loved me. He, we, I love us more than just rings. Everybody gonna be like, uh-huh, yeah, uh-huh. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm -mm, mm -mm. It don't work like that. If you did think it worked like that, get off that. Are you hearing what I'm telling you? So here it is. Um, it's important that you recognize that the Holy Spirit does more than make us speak in tongues. The Holy Spirit does more than make us shout and dance. The Holy Spirit does more than just gives us spiritual gifts, power gifts, as well as administration gifts uh, and spiritual offices. The Holy Spirit does everything. Everything is the container of everything that has to do for with the church. He is the executor. That's a better way to put it. He executes everything when it comes to the church. So in other words, even our eternal life, so the Holy Spirit is within us, is our assurance that we have already laid hold on eternal life and we shall be saved. Are you hearing what I'm telling you? So in other words, we use those words interchangeably, and I'm not trying to change them doctrinally at all tonight in this Bible study because I'll, I'll use them interchangeably myself. We say, I want to be saved. I'm saved. I, I, I'm spirit-filled. But the Bible clearly tells us the only way to secure your salvation, in other words, to be saved, because we are being saved. In other words, the only thing we truly can say now is that we are spirit-filled and we have the down payment on eternal life so that we can appropriate, hello, that's an accounting term, 
We can appropriate eternal benefits. We can appropriate eternal life. We can appropriate a life in heaven. We can appropriate our mansion in heaven, uh -huh, much room, by virtue of the Holy Spirit living within us. Therefore, we can use terms like I'm saved. It's an appropriation term. You only get this on the quest, so you might as well just, just, get, just get ready. It's an appropriation term. In other words, uh, I, I get this because of the down payment that God made in my heart through the token of the Holy Spirit, which says that this is a, a down payment on your redemption, your heavenly redemption and eternal life. And if you're a believer and all you're worried about is getting Bentleys and Benzes, if all you worried about is getting uh, the latest uh, house, a new house, and, uh, and, and, and getting all of the furs and everything else you can get, then shame on you. You missed the whole point. Those things are just the, 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 uh, the, the benefits. They are just the residual, the toys and the tinket, trinkets of the whole purpose of why we're doing this. We're doing this because we want eternal life. When is the last time you heard a message like this one or a series, series like this one that strictly just preached about eternal life? Do we shout off that? But if I tell you you're going to get a boo, you're going to get a husband, you're going to get a wife, if I tell you you're going to get a job, if I tell you God's about to give you a new home, God's about to open doors and no man can close, if I tell you that, you shouting all over the house, huh? Huh? He's going to heal your body. You, 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 he can do it. But what if I said he's going to give you eternal life? You're going to live with him forever. Huh? The devil got us tricked, church. He got us all messed up. He got us twisted. That we're so adapted to this present life, to this dirt, this, this, this earth, and this dirt of this flesh. Huh? We're so adapted to it that we forget the whole purpose of our being in the kingdom, and that is to gain eternal life. There is more than the idea of security in this text, for it clearly uh, gives to us the continuity and the identity of the blessings. Christians are united by faith in Christ and have received the spirit of Christ, which is a foretaste of the life to come. The inward renewal produced by the Holy Spirit culminates in the resurrection the transformation from this life to another life. Can I talk to you? Uh, the spirit is the, the, the vehicle that God uses. He is God. He is the, the vehicle that God uses to remind us that eternal life is coming. Hmm? Uh, he's a, he reminds us that God has greater blessings for us. I got to roll here. I can stay on that one all night, but I ain't going to do it. Verse number six. Therefore, we are always confident and know. We are always confident and we know. I'm just doubling down on that tonight. I need you to get that. We are always confident and we know that as long as we are at home in the body, we're away from the Lord. All right. Uh, the word know there means, of course, to have uh, an assurance of something. The word confidence there comes from a Greek word which means firmness of purpose in the face of danger or testing, to be courageous, to have courage, to be bold. bold. So, so let's look at how he connects confidence and knowing to the text. That as long as we are at home in this body, in this tent, this, this, this body is our home while we're here, we are away from the Lord. All right, let me explain that to you. So Paul, again, in his, in his, masterful, uh, his masterful writing, he, he, he again is making contrast. He's been making it, making contrast all the way since the fourth chapter. You know, we're perplexed on every side, but we're not in despair. He's making these, these tremendous contrasts, and here is he's making another one. So he begins to switch, and he begins to say, we're, we're confident because we know 
as long as we're in these bodies, and, and, and this knowing comes from a sense of hope. And, and the sense of hope is the idea of faith with fixation. All right, all right, I'm going to run that back. It has the idea of faith with fixation. In other words, it is faith that is focused on something. I'm hoping in something. Huh? You can say I have faith, but when you're hoping, it, it crystallizes, identifies, it, it, it places uh, with the Greek word skopos. It, it, it puts a goal towards it. In other words, so when we talk about I hope in God, and, and, and that should be a word that we hear much more in our churches because hoping, it, it, it centralizes, our, our, it gives a sense of centrality uh, to our, our faith. In other words, we're focused on something and Paul says, well, I'm here at home in this body. I don't have a death wish. I'm not being morbid. I'm not trying to go anywhere before my time. I want to finish my course. I want to do what God has for me. I want to enjoy my friends. I want to enjoy my family. I want some blessings out of this life. I want God to do some things in this life. But I do recognize that if I'm here in this body, that I'm away from the Lord. Now, he, what he's, he's not talking about that in a qualitative sense. Uh, because, of course, the Lord is in us. He lives with us through the Holy Spirit. We have the Spirit of Christ. But he's talking about being in the physical presence, excuse me, being in the spiritual presence of Jesus Christ in heaven, uh, or our souls being in the presence of the Lord in heaven. So in other words, it has to do with, with geography and this dirt, this flesh that is adapted to this earth that is kept bound by 14.7 pounds per square inch of gravity pressed upon it. Uh, this, this body that if it leaps up, it's coming back down, is uh, the, this, this agent or is this, this, this lump of clay that is keeping me from getting from my, to my best life. So we, we're thinking that this world and this body is our best life, but our best life is eternal life. Now, again, I, I run that back again because I, I don't want you to be so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good. He's not saying anything morbid here. He's just recognizing the fact that I can't be my absolute best, which is heavenly, because I'm bound to the earthly. All right, let's go. But, I'm con but he says, I've got confidence. And my confidence gives me firmness of purpose, even in the midst of my test. It gives me courageous, it makes me bold, even in the midst of my test. Can I talk to you a little bit about this body, this dirt? Um, I love my body. I, I, I go to the gym and uh, get on my bike and try to eat right. Uh, you know, I fall off the wagon like you do too, but it's okay. We'll, we'll be all right. Um, but really think about it with me. Uh, the, the, the transient reality, uh, the transient sur uh, surface reality here is that our lives in so many ways is adapted to spend billions of dollars collectively. Billions of dollars collectively trying to preserve something that will eventually be destroyed. Um, the music that we listen to the visual from, from social media and television, um, it all presses towards what the scripture says, that in the world there is the lust of the flesh, uh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. And, and what it truly is, it is, it, is, it is an opiate to the masses, using one of Karl Marx's phrases towards religion. Uh, all of these things are an opiate to the masses. Uh, that it, it keeps us so high that we forget all we're doing is putting a fur coat on flesh. All we're doing is, is putting a diamond ring on 
dirt. All we're doing is dressing up dirt. Now, I, I like to pop my collar like anybody else. I like to stay fly, no lie, you know, ball in. I, 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 I'm telling you, I got a whole bunch of color. So here it is. I, um, um, I like that like anybody else. I, I, I love an Armani suit and, 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 and I love uh, uh, Ferragamo shoes and, and, and I know you, lo you love your red bottom uh, Christian Louboutins and, 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 and I know you, you love Chanel and, and you got your favorite bag, whether it be Jimmy uh, or whether it be Prada or whether, it, whether uh, you know, Louis or Gucci or whatever it may be. All those things are wonderful things <laughs> to have fun here on earth. But don't get it twisted. Don't get it twisted that all of those things, they're going to burn and you and I are going to go back to dirt. So wouldn't I, it uh, seem that if we're spending billions of dollars, trillions of dollars collectively on all these things to uh, cause our dirt to be, you know, satisfied, our flesh, then wouldn't we want to invest that much into our spirit? And it cannot be spiritual money, but it can be prayer. It can be drawing close to God. It can be, it can be glorifying and magnifying and praising and worshiping God. How in the world could we, we adapt so much to our flesh and our own entertainment, but we have a hard time when it comes to the simple things to God? Come worship me once a week at least. Every worshiper must do it every day, but okay, we, you know, some are still in the first grade spiritually, so we work with it. Um, you can't even do that, but but you you can't make an investment. Huh? Yeah, I'm talking to you if it's you. You you can't, and if it ain't you, send it to the person that it need to be sent to. Um, you can't make an investment in your eternal life, but you can make an investment in your flesh. Something's not wrong. When a Christian, when a person really gets saved, that whole thing shifts. Huh? And you begin to really realize what is important. And that's my eternal life. Huh? Paul's whole life is, is fused with confidence because of the assurance of the resurrection. This doesn't mean that we live in an otherworldly haze. You know, you know, every five steps we speaking in tongues, and uh, you know, every day you can't say hi to nobody. Every everything, uh, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. And I'm not saying nothing wrong with that if that's what you want to do, but don't use those those things uh, to be so earthly, so heavenly minded. You know, earthly good. You can say hi and be normal. Can I talk to you? Uh, but his confidence was in the world that is to come. So thank God that the Spirit's presence is in our life. It betokens the idea that there is greater to come. Huh? There is greater to come. Check out the check out the, the, the Hebrew writer. He, he says something to us. He said the writer of Hebrews recognizes the truth when he speaks of this. He says, we are those who have tasted of the heavenly gift who have shared the Holy Spirit and have tasted the goodness of the word of God. I got to roll here. Verse number seven. For we live by faith and not by sight. We are confident. There's that word confidence again. I say and would prefer to be away from the body and to be at home with the Lord. What does that mean? Paul said he was so spiritual that he said, I would prefer to be away from this physical body and to be at home with the Lord. You see that kind of, see how he flipped it up? He did that Jedi mind trick thing. He said, okay, this is my home and my body, but my real home is in the presence of the Lord. So how am I living? How are you living? I'm living by faith and not by sight. In other words, let us digress to our everyday situations. In other words, if we're doing that when it comes to eternal life, then how much more should we do that when it comes to everyday life? That we don't always see how God is working. We don't always see how God is moving. We don't always see what he's trying to do in our life or will be doing in our lives. So we can't always go by what we see. We got to go by what we know. 
and we know that our God is able. I'm about to revolutionize your whole spiritual life. In other words, God is saying to you, don't you be caught up in the outcome. You be caught up in the process because he's the God of the outcome uh, that has given you the strength to go through the process. You better reach your hands up. And my God, if you ain't praising him right now for that person dealing with cancer, you don't you, don't you, you let him be the God of the outcome. Uh-huh. But you be the believer in the process. Can I can I talk to somebody that's dealing with COVID-19 right now? Don't you be you let God be the God of the outcome, but you uh, allow him to work, you be the one who works in the process. That person that's waiting for that job and say, is it coming through? Don't you be adapted to the outcome. Let him be the God of the outcome, but you be the one who prays him for the process. So I'm living by faith. I'm breathing by faith. I'm walking by faith. I'm talking by faith. I'm courageous by faith. I'm bold by faith. I'm victorious by faith. I'm triumphant by faith. It's already done in my favor by, did I hear you? Oh my God, put it in the context. Somebody say by faith, by faith, by faith. Somebody say by faith, by faith, by faith. Not by what I see, because if I've gone off what I see, then I would have stumbled a long time ago. My God. Paul takes it back up. Let's take it back up to a higher level. He says, I got confidence that I'm living by faith, not by what I see, not these trials, not these tribulations. But you know what? I would prefer to be with Jesus. Now, that's some grown up right there. Mm -hmm. That's some grown grown right there. That's some grown grown in the spirit right there. When the last time you said that? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And you probably shouldn't because we're not ready. Are you hearing what I'm telling you? But that's some grown, grown in the spirit. Uh huh. Not a death wish, not hating his life, but saying, you know what? Jesus is all right if you come. And you come to a, space, a place of spiritual maturity where you can enjoy your life, enjoy your family. But always in your spirit as a believer, you got your bags packed. Uh huh. Are you hearing what I'm trying to tell you? Uh -huh. You got your bags back. And like the old people used to sing the song, traveling shoes, Lord, traveling shoes, Lord. I got on my traveling shoes. Are you hearing me? In other words, yours are not far away. You ain't going to get caught in the fire. You ain't going to get caught in the flood because you're going to always be ready. I don't have to get ready. Uh huh. So I stay ready. I don't stay ready so I don't have to get ready. Are you hearing what I'm trying to tell you? What God is saying to Paul is saying, I prefer to be with the Lord, but while I'm here, I'm going to do what I'm supposed to do. How about you believers? Uh, our spirit should be crying now and for even so, come Lord Jesus. I am in no way uh, so spiritual uh, that I have some death wish. Uh, I'm going to be with Jesus tomorrow. But all my days, I will, if he wants me to live a hundred, if I'm healthy, I, I will live a hundred. However it is, I, 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 praise the Lord. But let me tell you what, as a believer, and I'm saying this personally, and I want you covenant, and I want you all my friends that are watching, I want you to be able to say, Maranatha, that's a Greek word, uh, that's a, a New Testament word rather, that means come Lord. So a believer always has in him. If Jesus comes back tomorrow, it'll be fine with me. I ain't got nothing else to do. No, oh, no, no. I gotta, I gotta go uh, take care of this business. Uh, uh, no, uh, no, no. Like that, man, man, to follow Jesus, I gotta go to bury my, my. Uh, no. Oh no, I ain't been married yet. I haven't had a family. I haven't had children yet. I, there ain't no marriage on this earth is gonna be more blissful than the marriage of the bride and the bridegroom. Could I encourage you? All right, let's go. I'm running out of time here. This is getting too good. <laughs> This is getting too, this is just incredible. Let's get, I got some more for you. So he says, being home in the body, two Greek words there. Uh, the first uh, is uh, in the mail, is, means to be located where one lives. Now, uh, in, in, in study, I, I, went to, I went to theology school just to learn this, just for you. Uh, the, the second is to be absent from the body, ek de mail. It's the only word. Anytime you see E-N, it means to go in. Anytime you see the prefix E-K, it means to go out. So, 
Paul is contrasting again, and he says that uh, to be uh, home in this body where I live means to be absent with the Lord, but I desire to be with the Lord. So what Paul repeats is his confidence, and he's yet not ashamed to express his preference to be away from the body, which is a metaphor for death, and at home with the Lord, which is a, a metaphor for the resurrection. And what that means is what I'm trying to do in this teaching is to get your mind that the Lord Jesus is coming back soon. You're, we're afraid of uh, coronavirus and wars, uh, borders, uh, uh, troops are, are gathering on the Ukraine border as I speak from Russia. The United States is, is sending war materials because negotiations are, are running out. Huh? Uh, we are dealing with over 5 million people dead in, in a two-year people uh, 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 two time frame from this pandemic, which uh, for 7.5 billion people is minuscule, but it, it shows us how arrested the world could get in a short period of time. Huh? We've seen governments upheaval, even insurrection in our own country. We've seen the, the, the power of the, the, of the politics of, of cult politics, uh, of taking the minds of people. We have conspiracy theories. We, we, we believe that the, the vaccinations that are the mark of the beast and, 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 and they are some part of some, some uh, nefarious plan by the government for pharmaceuticals or even uh, the son of perdition, the Antichrist. Uh, all these things are playing in. And we salad picking tomatoes and croutons in little pieces and missing the whole point that all of it is holistic to the apocalyptic teaching. That's a, that's a big word. It just means uh, the, the time of tribulation to the to the eschatological teaching. The eschatological teaching that means just the eschaton or, or the end time. Uh, it, it is a whole big picture of which we as believers is. Is COVID-19, 2021 20, and 22 a part of that? Absolutely. Are wars and rumors of wars a part of that? Absolutely. Is the love of many waxing cold? Absolutely. Is the love of love of pride and flesh more than lovers of God? Is that it? Absolutely. Is the great falling away from people not wanting to worship? I ain't going back to church. I don't believe in all that. This resurgence of, 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 of ancient religions that have already been debunked for thousands of years, but people are yet uh, uh, going after them. Is that part of the end time? Absolutely. Let's not get caught in the forest staring around at the trees. Can I talk to you? I got a whole teaching coming next month on that. You don't want to miss it. Somebody say, teach, Bishop. So in other words, in order to, to, get, to get out of one body or into one home, we got to leave out of another home. So in other words, we've got to, we've got to have these mortal bodies transform into a glorified body. We got to go out from this state to get into that state. And that only comes through death or through the rapture. So I want you to reformulate as hard as it is your concept of Christians in, in death. It is just going out of one state to go into another state. It is going out of one life to go into eternal life. Can I go ahead and give you some more word before we get ready to wrap this up tonight? Verse number nine, check it out. So we make it our goal to please him, whether we are at home in the body or away from it. Uh, King James Version said it like this. I kind of like King James a little better on this. Wherefore, we labor, that's the word goal there, that whether presence or absence, we may be accepted of him. So no matter if I'm in my physical tent or my heavenly home, whether I'm on earth or in heaven, my goal is to labor, uh, is to aspire 
to have a cherished desire. It's a lofty goal. It's a high calling. I'm trying to get to heaven, y'all. Huh? To be accepted of him means to be well pleased, that he's well pleased, giving pleasure and satisfaction, perhaps in a greater degree than usual. I got to break that down. So he says, whether I'm in this physical body or I'm in heaven, I'm accepted of him. I'll never be more loved, Yeshavosa, than I am right now. Huh? I'll never be more adored than I am right now. Because he loves me and he loves you to a superlative degree. In other words, he gave his son the greatest thing and the most precious thing that God had. His son came in the flesh, God in man form, for the purpose of redeeming you and I. So the idea of this is that you're already accepted. Are you perfect? No, but you're accepted. Do you get it right all the time? No, but you're accepted. Do you cross every T and dot every I? No, but you're accepted. That idea of his acceptance, heavenly acceptance, while we're still in an earthly existence. Uh, did you get that? The idea of his heavenly acceptance while we are still in an earthly existence is so profound that even if we haven't dotted every I, and even if we haven't crossed every T, it should pull us and draw us like a magnet. It should pull us and draw us like a moth to a flame. It should pull us and draw us towards his pledge, his life, and his light. In other words, we do better because he's given us better. Ah, we, we go higher because he's calling us higher. We come forth because he's calling us for, I got to roll here. My God, what a word tonight. Verse number 10, let's go. Let's get all of this. Verse number 10, let's go. For we must all pe appear. Check out how Paul did this. He flipped it. He said, all right, I'm about to get a little serious with y'all. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body whether good or bad. First uh, clause there, must appear. To present oneself formally as before an authority. Where are you going to present? You're going to present before the judgment seat of Christ. All right, that's the, that's the place of litigation of which a judge is present to issue official decisions. Now, I want you to notice something here, and I, 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 don't, I, I can't have you miss this, that he says, we must all. Therefore, he is talking to Christians. He's talking to people that are already have, the, have the, the deposit of the Spirit. And he says, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. This is very eschatological. He's saying, all right. Even though you're saved, or being saved, you still must live in such a way to give an account for the deeds done in your body. So what, what this is, is speaking of here is it, it, is it moves us from the idea of this, these humanistic thoughts that if I'm saved, that's all I have to do. I'm, I'm saved. I don't go to church, but I'm saved. No, you're not. Did you, see, did you see what Bishop said? Yeah. No, you're not, because the Holy Spirit in you won't let you do it. You're just talking. You're making up your own religion. You're calling that, you know, Jonesology. You're calling that, you know, you know, Griffinology. You, that's what you're doing. That's what you're doing. Uh, you know, um, you, you're, you're, you're making it up. Holy Spirit won't let you do it. What, what is happening, he says, we're going to have to go before the throne of God, every one of us, and appear. Now, uh, in, 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 as far as uh, salvation or soteriology, it's another big word we use that means just salvation to be saved. 
it does may, may not mean that you're going to be cast into hell, but it does mean that your works are going to be judged. The Bible talks about that again in another uh, passage as Paul writes to the Corinthians. Um, you know, those crowns of wood, stone, and hay. I don't have time for that Bible study tonight, but if you want it, just put it in the chat, the chat and we'll, we'll do that one as well. Um, the question is, if, are you a high achiever? Now, I'm an A type of personality. I, I got an alpha, an alpha kind of personality. I, I just do. I just do. If I take a test, I want an A. Are you hearing what I'm telling you? I write a paper, I want an A. I, I just, that's just who I am. If I'm going to do the thing, I want it right. Uh, everybody's not like that, and, uh, and I'm not saying one is better than another. That's just it. Well, it's the same way in the kingdom. Um, I don't want to be just some nominal Christian that's, you know, I got into heaven on the, you know, by the skin of my teeth, I barely made it. And, uh, but my, my, my fear is too many of you uh, are those kind of Christians. Uh-oh. And my fear is I've been doing something wrong. I have been doing something wrong as a pastor. Yes, Lord Jesus, forgive me. I've been doing something wrong because I have been producing for some reason with all of the fire that I have for God, too many nominal Christians that won't mind getting into heaven with their works being burned up like wood, stubble, and hay. I am trying to produce silver and gold Christians. People that when the fire of God's judgment hits it, it's only going to refine them more. But some of you are going to go into heaven with your draw smoking. Did I say that? I'm sorry. I, 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 let me tell you. Well, the Jew said it. He said some people you got to pull out of the fire. Even their, their garments still being uh, spotted by sin. In other words, I'm not trying to go with, with into heaven with smoke, the smoke barely making it. I'm trying to go in with good works. How do you do that? It talks to us that one day we're going to stand before that judgment seat of Christ. And you're not going to be able to, to melt into the crowds. You're not going to be uh, able to go off of mama's works and daddy's work. You're going to be held accountable for your own individual accent. Huh? The chances that anyone might fool God who uh, knows even our subconscious is null. What humans do in the body has moral significance and eternal consequences. I'm going to say it again. What humans do in the body have moral significance and eternal consequences. Therefore, you have to watch how you live even as a Christian. And that's why we, and, and, and that's why our church, and, and my next book is coming out in, in March, for, and I want you to be at my book signing, whether online or in person, and I have a whole section on unconditional eternal security, which is one of the biggest biggest uh, scriptural farce that there is. Uh, that uh, it's the notion that I'm once saved and I'm always saved. And I know many endearing Christians uh, believe that, but they only believe that because they were told that. They, were, they don't believe that because they trace that in the scriptures. That's a Calvinistic thought that came from John Calvin that ran down the gamut of denominational churches and the people teach it only because it has been the orthodoxy of their denomination. And nowhere in the scripture says that I'm once saved, I'm always saved, I can live any kind of way I want, and I'm going to make it to heaven. But let me play angel's advocate here. Let me play angel's advocate here. That perhaps, okay, maybe you can get baptized, and that's all you got to do. You can keep being a drunkard. You can be, keep being a... A uh, fornicator, you can keep being a good at adultery, you can keep being a rapist, you can keep being a criminal, and, and all of these things, and you can find absolution because of that one time you were baptized. Now, I know even my friends that are a part of churches, and I know it's not that simplistic, but it really is the way it sounds to us that don't adhere to it. It sounds very that you can do anything and you'll still be saved. I know that you say that a person who's really saved is going to want to serve God. But that's, that's not what is being uh, conveyed in, in explicitly in the teaching. It's just saying that if I once saved, I got baptized, and I know people go to their grave, and I got baptized, and that was it. They never stepped foot in the church. 
uh, but they thought that's what it was. That's that hybrid Christianity. All right, that was for free. Everyone who is mindful of their morality must therefore be mindful of their, uh, of their excuse me, everyone who is mindful of their mortality must therefore be mindful of their morality. I'm going to run that back. Everyone who is mindful of their mortality must therefore be mindful of their, mor their morality. Swazel said it like this. The body, far from being a burdensome en uh, envelope for the divine soul, is the very place where man is tested in terms of which he will be questioned in the judgment. Our moral responsibility before God means that Christians can never be indifferent. It behooves even believers to test themselves and undergo the final testing by God when they are remind, remanded before the judgment seat of Christ. Wow. Uh, second, second Corinthians 13, 4 said it like this. For though he was crucified through weakness, yet he liveth by the power of God. Talking about the weakness of the flesh. Talking about Christ. But he lives by the power of God within him because he is God. For we also are weak in him. But we shall live with him by the power of God towards you. Examine yourselves. Whether you be in the faith, he is talking to Christians here. Examine yourself whether you be in the faith and prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates. In other words, if you can't examine your own spiritual life and you can't smell your own stink, that means that you're spiritually reprobate and there are many people that teeter on that daily. But I trust that ye shall know that ye are not reprobates. Wow. Garland said it like this. If we hope to be conformed to Christ's glorious body in the next life, we must be conformed to his character in this life. Let me close off by saying what's due. What's due, Bishop? What's due? The reward of eternal life is based upon Deeds done in the body. Just in case we forgot, I'm going to just go over Galatians 5 and 9, 19 and 22. Just in case we got lost in the shuffle. Just in the case we forgot that there is a relative holiness that is going to be the precipitous of us uh, going into eternal, into eternal life. Just in case we forgot. I read it in the New Living Translation. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, that's me and you, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Let me tell you again. Paul said, let me run that back. <laughs> I, I, I'm cracking up here, y'all. Paul said, let me run that back. <laughs> Just in case you missed it. Let me run it back. As I told you before, that anyone that's living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There's no law against these things. So, how do we do this? We are to be faithful in our time used towards God. We are to use our opportunities and pursue them vigorously. We are to have a singleness of mind in our Christian service and our Christian faith. Stop being so complex in your Christian faith and putting all of these riders and additives onto it 
in order to try to weaken its effect in your life. Just let it be what it is. And I'm telling you, you'll see that it's good. Huh? We've been we've not been saved for aimless or indifference, aimlessness or indifference, but for a life of service toward God. We are justified by faith alone. The faith that justifies is expressed by love and obedience. Check out what Barrett says, and I'll close here. We are saved not by good works, but we are saved for good works. Amen. Wow, what a word tonight. What rich teaching. You know, people say, I love the word. Well, that is the word tonight. And it's the most important word of why we're doing this. Because we want, we want eternal life. We want this dirt, huh? this dirt, to be overshadowed with eternal life. And our glorious bodies, that's our resurrected, glorified, illuminated bodies, will go with Christ and live with him eternally. But if you do not have the down payment of the Holy Spirit, you will not go to heaven. You will not go to heaven. But there's good news. Say what, Bishop? That the Holy Spirit is available for everyone. And tonight you can receive Jesus as your Savior. Will you pray with me? Make a decision right here and right now for Jesus Christ. Pray, Lord Jesus, come into my life and be my Savior. I repent of my sins. I believe that you died, you were buried, and raised again three days later. I believe that your blood is powerful to wash me from all sins. I accept you now as the Lord and the Savior of my life. Come into my life, Lord, and be my God, and be my King, and I will serve you the rest of the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, the information is on the screen. Get in touch with us at Covenant Church, theclubberkeley.org. You can call us at 510-570-2105. Our team will get with you and pray with you, teach you what it means to, to be spirit-filled, get you baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is the family name, and you too can be ready for the rapture, for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is, I believe, coming very soon. Amen. Well, tonight it's time for us to give to the Lord before we get ready to go. On Tuesday nights, you always do such a wondrous job in your giving, and I certainly appreciate that. But you know what? Heaven honors it even more. So you're honored for heaven for your giving tonight. Usually in this offering, it, it gives opportunity for our friends that are not even members of our church, maybe they're coming from all over the country, uh, to, to share and, and, and to sow. Uh, the information is on the screen. We typically take the money from our Tuesday nights to, to do our missions work around the world, uh, whether it be in South America, Central America, Africa, India, uh, that South Asian uh, area. Uh, we are able to help missionaries and, and to do work even here domestically by feeding the people on a daily basis. So give to the Lord. Our information is on the screen, whether you want to put a check in the mail or go online to our website, thecubberkeley.org, or whether you want to go to our church giving app called Secure Give, similar to Giveify or uh, the different church, church giving apps that are out there. Cash app, uh, we take that too, as well as by text. All that information on the screen. But make sure that in every opportunity you have to give to the Lord, you give the Lord that absolute best offering. You give it as unto the Lord. Lift that offering to the Lord. Father, we thank you for your love and kindness and these hands that are lifted up. God, uh, as uh, offerings were lifted up to you, Father, I pray, God, uh, throughout the whole Bible, I pray, God, that you will bless them and that you will cause them uh, to never know lack. Someone's worried about their money, trying to figure out how they're going to negotiate this and how they're going to change that. Well, I want to tell you, I'm going to let them know that, God, you are in their business and you're working it out for their favor. So, Father, I pray blessings upon them. I pray great things in their life. And we know 
that God, you are the God of all sufficiency. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, God bless you, loved ones. Again, I want to remind you, Sunday morning, our doors are open, 8 a.m., 11 a.m. You want to come here, Bishop Woods, in person, covenant members. If you are not coming to service because of COVID reasons, and that should be the only reason, um, and whatever that is extenuating, I'll leave that up to you. Uh, but at 11 o'clock a.m., I look for every covenant member to be on the broadcast. Amen? At every le level. From executive teams to ministerial staff to uh, workers to lay members, um, your shepherd teaches you, and I'll be ready to do just that 11 o'clock Sunday morning. All right. I love you with all my heart, and I will see you soon. God bless you.